how banks work in good times and in bad times. So one thing is clear, regulation has changed. We have come to a more strict regulation with higher capital requirements, with uh, liquidity requirements, with a leverage ratio and so on and so forth. And this has been put immediately and with great um, political pressure, G20 and so on. The question is, is this regulation the right regulation? So that's one of the key motivation for our, for our work. Okay, let me see if I know how to go down to the next page. La flecha de abajo. Desapareció. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, uh, different chapters to cover different issues. The, okay. the first thing is, of course, can we build a theoretical framework to think about uh, a systemic crisis? And the second thing is to what extent we have an endogenous risk that is built within the banking system with, uh, while supervisors and regulator maybe are not fully aware of the building of such imbalances. The third issue we wanted to cover is, of course, contagion and the fragility of the whole banking system. Then the real cost of financial crisis, the measure of systemic risk, systemic risk and microprudential regulation, systemic risk and macroprudential regulation, monetary policy and systemic risk, and we finish with a chapter on the new challenges for regulatory policy. And so I will try to cover some of these issues in uh, it is one hour and 20 minutes, if I'm correct. Yeah, one hour. So, so first, on the theoretical front, okay. So it would be great to have a unique model to understand how risk is, uh, is there, how moral hazard could appear, how adverse selection affect the whole market, but uh, in fact, what we observe is a multitude of small models that cover each a fraction of the reality we observe. The only thing we can definitely say is that a systemic event, systemic risk, will result from the combination of, first, a macro, a state of macro financial fragility. That, by the way, may be known or unknown, right? Because it is true that it is in good times that financial fragility builds up. And we just discover it in bad times, but it's there. So first, macro financial fragility that may be related to a great rate of growth and consequently very high leverage and things work perfectly well. But macro financial fragility anyway. Second, contagion. And third, a trigger. And you have asked me what could be a trigger before the crisis, I would have bet on hedge funds. And I would be completely wrong. It was a surprise. But the trigger could be anything that switches the equilibrium and makes people coordinate on another type of equilibrium. So what we observe in this, in all this research are two different lines of approach. One is based on microeconomic foundations and questions, what are agents' incentives? How do they react? And these are micro models, quite often static, that try to represent one side of the behavior of the economic agents that are involved. On a completely different front, what we have is the DSG approach, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, 
and that offers a completely different view as it integrates, it, it covers mainly the general equilibrium view with the fact that with the advantage, of course, that it is possible to predict what is the effect of one variable on the, the general equilibrium, what is the effect of this other, for typically the monetary, monetary contraction, monetary expansion will be the key inputs to the model. And nowadays, we have a new generation of DSG models where a financial imperfection is introduced. And so, thinking about the two, my, uh, there is one sentence in the book that uh, is rather pessimistic and simply states, with micro foundation, we, in, we are able to understand we cannot measure and with the SGE, we're able to measure what we cannot understand. And it's a bit, and it's a bit in between the two that we have to fight to get a better understanding of the whole, of the whole banking industry. So first point, okay, we know, we know that financials, financial imbalances build up in good times. And so what are the main driving forces and the obvious culprit is of course credit booms. Credit booms increase the probability of a systemic crisis and so this is uh, Jorda, Schularik and Taylor develop this, uh, this point and they also show that if in addition we have a credit boom before uh, standard business cycle crisis, then what we have is a longer crisis and a deeper crisis. Similar, similar results have been obtained by Bruno Meyer and Sanikov, by Gurinchas and Oxfell, with, uh, with uh, a more international view of crisis, and so they show that in addition to credit expansion, the increased leverage and real currency appreciation appear also as elements for the buildup of financial imbalances. Okay, so you can say, well, now we know, we know that when there is excessive credit expansion, then we have a higher probability of a crisis. But the bad news is that if you take the reverse probability, so how many, what is the probability? Uh, De La Riccia and, and others tell us that, well, in fact, it's only one in three credit brooms that ends up in a crisis. So we cannot suddenly suppress all credit booms in order to, in order to limit financial crisis because this would be throwing away the baby with the bathwater. So, what drives us, what drives credit booms again? Well, first, very important, lower credit standards. We now know that uh, and there is both the theoretical side of the changing credit cycles through the, through the business cycle, credit standards through the business cycle. So in good times, lending standards are lax, in bad times, lending standards are more strict and there is and there is evidence that i think it's uh, loan and morgan that produced in 2006 one of the first papers uh, also burger and udell have uh, also uh, a paper on credit standards how how the memory of uh, loan officers is somehow lost with new generations and, and so on. And this leads to lax credit standards as things go as we are in normal times. And the memory of the last crisis is drifting away. Uh, Adrian and Shin have a very interesting paper on uh, the liability structure where they show 
that when the price of assets goes up, investment banks tend to leverage more. And so they take more risk as things are improving. Of course, when we go to commercial banks, the results are not as robust. But nevertheless, it's interesting because it shows that basically with the same capital, if your the value of your assets increase, you will leverage more and you will increase the total size of your balance sheet. Monetary expansion and low interest rates is one of the things we have, I think, learned now with the crisis on the one hand, but also with the incredible rich data sets, data sets that central banks have been accumulating in the last years and that now allow us to have very precise empirical analysis of, uh, of the effect of both monetary expansion and low interest rates on the behavior of banks and on, the, on lending standards as well. Bubbles is typically a combination, uh, in combination with credit booms, uh, an ingredient in triggering financial crisis. Uh, of course, you may remember before the crisis that uh, basically the, the governor of the Fed was always saying it's impossible to predict a crisis. We can manage the crisis when it's there, but it's very difficult to say when there is a bubble and whether it will burst if it's such a bubble. Right? Basically, the idea being that it's only if it bursts that we will discover, as we did with the dot-com, that there was a bubble. Nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, the current the current governor of the Fed, Yellen, had a different view, and uh, that I share. That is that you are able to identify bubbles when it's about real estate. It's impossible to identify them when it's a stock market, but when it's about real estate, then indeed it's possible to identify that there is a credit, uh, sorry, a bubble on the basis of the return on investment, on the basis of the rate of growth, and on the basis of the, the price of a house in relation to the, to the income of the buyer. Capital inflows have been also an element that is quite related to liquidity and to the monetary expansion. To some extent, the, both capital inflows as well as the sudden stop that sometimes uh, is the, the equivalent of the bursting of a bubble is this sudden stop that is quite important, particularly for emerging countries. So these are also key points in driving credit booms because it means that it is possible for the, for the US monetary base to expand because there is an inflow from China that accumulates and creates the saving glut that uh, the expression forged by Ben Bernanke. Corporate governance, interestingly, we have learned something, and I will develop this point later. With the crisis, we have indeed learned something on corporate governance and how corporate governance led to risk taking in banks. Competition may as well be a driving force in credit booms related quite often to hurting, right? And so, uh, the, exp the experience of uh, sp Spain is quite clear in that the credit boom led to the expansion of the Spanish cajas, these saving banks, and this expansion was with very low uh, lending standards, and this, of course, created the, all the problems with the, with the Spanish banking industry. And finally, more difficult may be to model 
is the issue of political economy. But I'm sure you have uh, you have read or heard that the the crisis, the housing uh, and mortgage crisis in the U.S. is related to the Clinton and Bush development of uh, a program for inexpensive housing and that led to the subprime and so on and so forth. So here, of course, electoral, electoral objectives may be right, may end up building a credit boom. So the other, the other dimension that is important is contagion, okay? And contagion, when we thought of contagion before the crisis, the main idea was counterparty risk. And so we thought, well, we thought of something that could be expressed as the domino effect. What happens if a large bank goes bust? Well, will it drive other banks bust simply because of the relationship between the assets of bank A and the liabilities of bank B. And so that was the idea. But at the same time, the empirical evidence was that these effects were not sufficiently important to create a systemic crisis. With the crisis, with the current crisis, our views have changed and uh, although of course although of course there is this uh, OTC uh, operations that create counterparty risk and consequently the AIG the AIG rescue on September 2008 was critical because otherwise all banks in the US and even abroad would have been left without their credit default swaps, without their, their insurance. And this is indeed counterparty risk. But basically, I think that with the current crisis, what we have learned is that liquidity was indeed critical. Liquidity that led to uh, important, to important uh, phenomena of cash in the market, whereby the, the demand was quite inelastic and therefore the, the prices simply adjust to a fixed demand. Consequently, the higher, the higher the supply, the lower the price. And with this very simplistic view of the market, we could explain a lot of things and we could explain in particular the prices the the crash in the asset backed securities and similar related assets that led again to a higher liquidity shortage in banks that have to go again and sell additional assets and so on and so forth same thing with liquidity shortage in the repo markets, the, what happens is you have these liquidity shortages and therefore you have a lower price of your assets and immediately you have a credit risk for banks and for the assets themselves. If you only can sell the assets at fire sale prices, if the volatility of your assets increase, then obviously you have to increase the haircuts on the repos. But once you increase the haircuts on the repos, the liquidity of financial institutions is reduced. And this, and this is something that happens in particular with toxic, with the so-called toxic assets. Indeed, indeed, the toxic assets were having a zero. They were considered triple A before the before the crisis, with the beginning of the crisis in 2007, they started to have 20% haircut, and after Lehman bankruptcy, 
they had a 100% haircut. That is, they were not accepted any longer as ripples. Debt deflation, uh, contagion through debt deflation, is a concept that goes back to Irving Fisher in 1933. He simply observed that banks tend to lend fully collateralized, and particularly during a crisis. But what happens is that you have a price of collateral, and he was observing the 29 crisis, and he observed that the price of stocks were going down. But when the stocks go down, then the collateral you have to lend goes down, therefore credit goes down. Of course, if credit to firms goes down, this implies lower employment, lower growth, and this in turn will have an effect on the price of assets and which are used as collateral. And so this, this uh, point has been developed by Kiyotaki and Moore more, more recently with this, same, with this same idea that changes in the price of collateral may have a huge multiplicative effect on economic activity through the credit market. And here, in terms of contagion, in terms of contagion, it means that a liquidity shortage may, may lead to a decrease in credit, may lead to a lower rate of growth, and this, in turn, will lead to a decrease in the price of assets. Quite similar, quite similar to that, in the sense that it's a decrease in credit, is the credit crunch that comes after major crisis. The credit crunch was discovered in the 90s in the, in the US after the US saving and loan crisis because banks were undercapitalized and in order to be recapitalized what they did was to lend to the government rather than lend to the, to the industry. Of course, while it was individually perfectly sound to lend to the government, raising capital in the middle of a crisis is particularly expensive, right? So while individually it was perfectly rational, in the aggregate, it meant less credit to the economy, it meant lower rate of growth for the economy. And so the economy, while the fundamentals were okay, couldn't proceed because of the solvency ratios, because banks wanted to have more capital and therefore were lending at with lending to the government rather than lending to the industry. And finally, contagion and shadow banking, well simply what we what we observed was that we had in this crisis the perimeter of the banking industry that seemed to be perfectly defined happened to include a number of non-banking institutions. I have already mentioned AIG, insurance. It's an insurance company, definitely non-banking, but also all these special purpose vehicles that were created with the securitization. When it came to the crisis, it turned out that in some countries like the US and the UK, banks have extended credit lines to these vehicles and therefore they had to repatriate, they had to repatriate their, these vehicles at the worst possible time. So, this is a messy diagram that I love because contagion is messy and so it shows how uh, somehow the different ingredients interrelate and basically what we are saying is that you have an impact of banks losses on macro fragility you have an impact on bank losses 
on asset prices and you have an impact of bank losses therefore on liquidity so that this interrelates every both counterparty risk liquidity risk and finally you even have an impact of these bank losses on the macroeconomic uh, fundamentals as you may have the exchange rate that changes you may have excess lending asset prices changes and so on and so while in the previous slide i tried to to give you a uh, one by one line of uh, contagion here is rather the other view i would like to emphasize the fact that liquidity and counterparty are definitely related and that they are both related to the price of assets Okay, and so uh, Luc Leven, our co-author uh, at uh, IMF, had uh, uh, a number of papers on the cost of financial crisis. And of course, here we only have the most uh, spectacular ones, but uh, of course I remember the tequila crisis of, in Mexico, and it had a huge, indeed a huge cost. And, uh, and what you see is because you have a fiscal cost, an increase in debt effect, and an output cost. And so when you look at the output cost, this means compared to trend, how much have we lost? So you have, you have a country that is, uh, that is growing at 10%, and then suddenly and then suddenly it grows at negative rates. And so you can see that uh, a number of countries have a cumulative output loss that goes above 100%, right? So something like a loss of 25% during four years, something like that, quite spectacular. So indeed, indeed, a good motivation for macroprudential regulation and for a monitoring of systemic risk. Okay, and this, these costs may be already reflecting that you have credit crunch, and I mentioned credit crunch in the, in the US in the 90s, but in, with the Asiatic, with the Southeast crisis of 97, we also observe a credit crunch. And with the, with the current crisis, we also observe a credit crunch, both in the US and for a longer period of time in Europe. So this, of course, reduces the rate of growth in the economy. Evergreening has also a cost, and we uh, this term, evergreening, refers to a possible behavior of banks. When a bank is close to bankruptcy, it may tend to hide its losses. And so while it would be efficient to terminate a loss, to terminate a loan, the bank will roll it over so, at the, at, so as not to have the losses in its balance sheet. And so evergreening means that you continue financing a bad project while it should be terminating. And this has a cost, again, in terms of growth, because you are financing something with a negative net present value. Zombie banks will be those that engage in evergreening, the expression zombie banks, referring to a bank with negative, with negative equity, but nevertheless, with sufficient access to the liquidity markets to continue oper operating. Gambling for resurrection, well, uh, in normal times, in normal times, banks lend to positive net present value projects. But when they are confronted with their own, with their own insolvency, it means that they have an option that if they take high risk, they may 
still continue in the game, while if they don't take any risk, they will definitely go bankrupt. And so the incentives are there, are there to gamble for resurrection. And also, also on the cost of uh, on the cost of financial crisis, these negative externalities that every bank failure creates, and that implies that implies that the relationship between a bank and its client is disrupted, and so all the information the bank has accumulated on a particular client, which is related to the idea of relationship banking, all this, which constitute an asset, is suddenly lost. And we have empirical evidence on, on, the, the, on the bankruptcy of Continental Illinois, for instance, that shows how the, how the bankruptcy of a bank affects the stock price of its clients. Okay, with all these, Rossier and co-authors show that countries that had a crisis grow faster in the aftermath, but still the cost of the crisis is there indeed. Okay. To let me remind everybody, uh, we have a microphone here at the room for those of you who can intervene here at SEMLA and uh, also for uh, for the people, the remote participants, which we had a record right now, the too many people. So you can submit your question by the chat and I submit, I will submit to Professor Fraser. Thank you. So, okay, so to cope with, to cope with this systemic risk with the building up of financial imbalances, we, we have to resort to micro and macro prudential regulation. And here, of course, the innovation is the macro prudential side. And these have difference in objectives, differences in focuses, in focus, and difference in the distortions they are trying to correct. They target different distortions. So, very different in view, and but maybe, as you all know, this is basically a lesson of the, of the current crisis, indeed, that micro prudential was not enough. And so, while microprudential is considered partial equilibrium as, as such, the macroprudential will consider general equilibrium. The risk in macro microprudential was the risk of an individual financial institution. And so the idea was that you could measure the value at risk. Well, when you take macroprudential view, is rather the risk of the system. That is, what is the risk of a financial institution knowing that another financial institution has gone down? And this is related to the concept put forward by Adrian and Bruno Meyer of COVAR, and COVAR is a conditional value at risk. What is what is the value at risk conditional on some other on some other uh, on some other financial institution going bankrupt and this will allow you to identify where the higher risk lies within your banking system the microprudential the microprudential concern about uh, concerning the bankruptcy of an isolated financial institution is with the socialization of losses. And this has been corrected to some extent in the sense that before the crisis, once a sufficiently large financial institution was in distress, the only credible 
solution was to bail it out. Now this regulation has changed and the, the point of socialization of losses is not as important. Contrasting with that, the macro prudential view considers the externalities, the spillover, the amplification, endogenous risk, and the financial cycle that we just mentioned, right? And so it monitors all these, all these interrelationships that build within the financial industry as risk increase. So, with microprudential, with microprudential, what we have is this moral hazard effect and the fact that because in case of distress we will have a bailout, then this, there may be a tendency to take excessive risks, to hide risk in the tail, to gamble for resurrection, and to have uh, diversification of risks as a positive, as a positive uh, point, while from the macroprudential view, what we will have is an excessive, the concern will be rather with systemic risk, and we'll have excessive systemic risk. We will have a concern with bubbles hurting irrational fashion, again, concern on the tail of the, of the risk distribution, and rather a positive view of diversity in the sense that if you have banks that are specialized, the bankruptcy of one of them may not affect the others. While if you have banks that are diversified, they hold basically the same assets and therefore they will go bankrupt together. And so, this implies that what seem to be reasonable at the microprudential level appears to be incorrect at the macroprudential one. So, this we refer to as the fallacy of composition, going from individual to aggregate. And so, take the sale of assets by an institution. Okay, from a micro prudential perspective, it means you have more liquidity, less the, the institution becomes more transparent, the institution is able to deleverage, you sell your assets, and consequently you are able to deleverage. But then, when you look at the macroprudential view, it means that all banks will be doing the same at the same time. They will all be selling their assets at the same time with a huge pressure on prices and creating, therefore, these fire sale prices that will jointly lead to huge losses to all banks. So the the perspective, the macroprudential perspective, is quite different here from the macroprudential. Same thing with the leveraging, with the leveraging that will create uh, risk at the systemic risk. And so, and so, uh, the view may be quite different. Okay. Now, one one point I wanted to mention is that we may tend all to adopt a view of a normative view of regulation. So what should we do? What should we do to have an efficient banking industry? Still, still there is another side to it, and that is the private interest view developed by the Chicago School, and that's capture theory, so that uh, Stigler, Stigler and Peltman identify the fact that uh, regulated or unregulated electri ele uh, power utilities end up with the same price for the consumers. So regulation didn't seem to 
to have any positive effect at the end side. And to some extent, this should be and can be applied to banking. And Krosner, Krosner has a, a, paper, a number of papers showing that this was the case in the US. Hopefully, it's not the case in any other country, of course. But, uh, but the idea is there is a demand and supply of regulation and banking industry lobbies are quite powerful and therefore they are able to influence the level of regulation or the shape of regulation we have. As an anecdote, as an anecdote think that nowadays we have this leverage ratio in Basel III, it's 3%, in the US it's 4%, and uh, European banks are desperate about this leverage ratio. Well, if you think of the 8% or 10.5% we have as capital ratio in Basel III, then you may say the 3% does not matter, it's not couldn't be binding if you have a 10.5%. But still, still, you have internal risk models that shows you possibly that you have a lot of AAA uh, lending. And consequently, uh, my understanding of all the fuss uh, that is raised by European financial institutions on this 3% leverage ratio is because they are happy to have very low internal risk ratings and therefore a very large number of, uh, of uh, loans that uh, go away with the 1.6% uh, capital charge and that, of course, going to the 3% would be a huge cost. Before the crisis, Deutsche Bank was at the 2% leverage ratio. Right? So, so it could be... It could be and so this will be quite in line, of course, if, if uh, lobbies are powerful enough, then it means that the Volcker rule is uh, watered down and therefore you can use a, a part of your own capital to cope with uh, proprietary trading and it means that the reinterpretation of uh, the leverage the 3% leverage rule will be changed, and so on and so forth. And so this is food for, food for thought, right? So somehow we have to think, we have to think that our regulation will be, let's put it, duly reinterpreted by the market. And we have to be careful accordingly. Okay, so the public interest view is the one we think should prevail and although possibly with with this caveat that we should consider not the regulatory measure measures as they are considered but rather the equilibrium that will result out of these regulatory measures okay and so capital regulation of course if we have a Modigliani-Miller world, capital regulation is irrelevant and we could have 100% capital for banks. And of course, when stating this, I am... So when Admati and Helwig claim that, uh, that the Modigliani-Miller world has not been duly integrated in the in the financial community well it's a bit problematic because uh, if you push forward the argument if the modigliani miller uh, in a modigliani miller world we don't need any financial institution and so although their point is quite correct that it's possible to raise it's possible to raise capital in our world where capital is still costly and therefore it means reducing the banking industry. Okay, so Basel II and Basel III have improved or well have made more strict the more strict uh, 
the capital regulation with a 10.5% uh, capital in good times and with a higher percentage for tier one and within tier one for core equity, right? So the quality of capital has been improved indeed. Although we do have this, but still no, no change on the internal risk approach. And the question is, well, to, to what extent can banks reinterpret, reinterpret or redefine the internal risk models when they are in trouble? And so there might be, there might be a tendency to do that. And uh, the, the anecdotes of uh, of Lehman using the so-called repo 105 rule to account for their repos when nobody else in the market was using that, well, tell us that when you are in trouble, uh, manipulation is a good way out. And so this has not been his. This has not been changed. Nevertheless, a number of mistakes that were regulatory mistakes. For instance, on, on shadow banking, right? The fact that you can, in the US and in the UK, you can securitize and at the same time give a liquidity line to the special purpose vehicle. This was clearly a mistake. This has been corrected. The fact that derivatives that were not traded on and cleared in a, in a, with a clearing house had the same risk weight that derivatives that were clear with the clearing house. This obviously didn't make sense. And with crisis, this has been happily, happily corrected. So corporate governance, corporate governance uh, with the crisis, we have discovered that corporate governance was an issue. And before the crisis, we tended to require from banks that they have more independent members in their board. With the crisis, we have learned some additional facts. And I think this is particularly interesting. First, OK, with the crisis, the first reaction was to say, well, there is a problem with executive compensation. Hmm? Executive compensation based on uh, stock options implies that the executive may have a tendency to take huge risk and to ride the bubbles, to herd with other banks, and so on and so forth. So is this the case? The answer is, to some extent, yes because there is this Xiraki paper that shows that sales by insiders right before the crisis in 2006 were 39% larger for high exposure banks. And so, and so it meant that they did have information about how large the extent of the crisis was. But the crisis told us more additional points. Because if the first reaction we had was, well, these executive compensation plans with stock options, by the way, quite often related to the fact of avoiding paying more taxes. But that's another thing. So if the first reaction we had was, the executive compensation was leading to too much risk. Then additional papers show that, in fact, shareholders were very happy with this high risk the banking institutions were taking. And if you think of it, you may think, well, a shareholder is someone that has a very well diversified portfolio, right? So the banking industry could be 2% of the portfolio, 3%, why not? 
And if so, you want the, a good return and you don't care about, about the downturn and the bankruptcy and the effects of bankruptcy. So Fallenbrack and Stoss show, consider different banks with different levels of shareholder activism. How, how shareholders were pressuring the banks and this you can consider by the structure by the structure of shareholding. And so they show that precisely banks where shareholders have more power on the decisions, shareholders were, have, were more powerful within the board of directors were those banks that had higher losses. So that beyond too risky executive compensation, there was simply the fact that the shareholders themselves defined these packages so that the executives took risk and so that they have a higher return. Okay, so that's one, one interesting paper. Another quite related to corporate governance that uh, another paper I like, I like a lot is by Elul and Yeramili, and they consider how well treated is the chief risk officer in a bank. Okay, that's easy to do. Banks report the, report the salaries of their chief executive and of their chief risk executive. As simple as that, they take the ratio, they take the ratio of what the chief risk officer makes to what the chief executive officer makes, and they use that to explain the losses in the crisis. So, this means that it is the whole banking, the board of directors, that says, well, we don't want, we are not that interested in measuring risk, in monitoring risk. We are interested in marketing, in development, in expansion. And of course, this again shows that it's not only about executive compensation packages, it's rather that it's interesting for bank shareholders to take risk and say, well, we, we want to put our resources rather in expansion, in the expansion, in growing, rather than in monitoring risk. So nowadays, we have these new bank bankruptcy laws and we have living wills in, uh, in a number of countries. In the UK, they have risk ring fencing. We have bail-in and contingent capital. And this is, I think, critical. It will, of course, increase the cost of banks funding, right? Because, because now bailouts will not be the rule. It will imply, and this is even part of the of the regulation in number of uh, of countries, then it will increase the cost, but in exchange, moral hazard will decrease because then, even if you have a bailout, you have a bailout of basically short term uh, short term debt, while all subordinated debt and uh, long-term bonds will have to face uh, to be part of uh, the losses and so they they will be uh, this will be called bailinable securities and this is as i see it at least a very positive point that has improved a lot with micro regulation after the crisis not only, not only will this imply that we'll have a lower cost for taxpayers, it will also imply that, we'll, that risk taking by banks will have a cost. And therefore, the risk return, the risk return trade-off at the level of bank managers will be more transparent and will not take into account the subsidy that is implicit in any bailout. There is some risk uh, 
indeed that if your cost of funds is higher, it may be the, ca the case that there is a tendency, therefore, for banks to search for yield. But, but in principle, the reduction of moral hazard should go in the right direction. Systemic risk and macroprudential regulation now. Well, macroprudential could be seen as two, with two different legs. You have a cross-sectional dimension that is rather, um, that is concerned with first, the systemically important financial institution and its impact, of course, but this more generally is related with contagion. And so the a systemic risk board, a macro prudential institution will consider this, how large is the, how extent is the risk of contagion. It will consider as well the amplification and feedback effects, for instance, through fire sales, and it will consider the general equilibrium effects that imply consolidating the banking industry with, you know, the through the credit default swap with a part of the insurance industry and with uh, the shadow banking in general. Confronting this first leg, we have a second leg, that is the time dimension. As we were saying, we have a buildup of financial imbalances and therefore macroprudential regulation should also take care of this. This implies to consider the procyclicality, to consider this endogenous risk taking, this building up of financial imbalances and monitoring them. And well, then of course, seeing systemic crisis as a discontinuity in time, so that somehow you declare, you identify that this is a systemic crisis and put into place all possible crisis management instruments that are available. There is some relationship between the two, the two sides, the cross-section and the time dimension, because, because when you have weak fundamentals, that is, in, uh, when, you, when the imbalances are building up, contagion is higher, as shown by, in a paper by Eyer and Pedro. Okay, so huge number of, of macroprudential instru instruments and so, and so, our view is very broad in the sense that we consider that you can apply a number of instruments that affect directly the balance sheet of the banks. In general, in general, if you take it strict to sensu, the macro macro prudential instruments are somewhat limited to the counter cyclical capital buffer and to the announcement of the systemic risk of a systemic risk uh, a level of systemic risk but here we take a broader view and the the number uh, of macro prudential instruments is uh, important so let me be quite brief on this, stating that there are a large number of instruments that can be used both in a counter-cyclical way and in a cross-sectional way. Some are well, are well established and so, for instance, the systemic liquidity surcharges are well defined, and so uh, the way to identify systemically important financial institutions is quite 
quite clear. We have we have a number of dimensions of how large it is, how global it is, and so on and so forth. And with this number of dimensions, we have a level of risk that implies a level of capital surcha surcharges from zero to three hmm? percent. Okay, <clears throat> and so we have these macroprudential instruments indeed. But to what extent are these pure macroprudential? Well, we can we can think about it. And this is related to the structure of macroprudential and microprudential, how these two regulatory bodies interact and talk to each other will be a key ingredient in the in how effective the banking and financial regulation will be. <clears throat> so when we talk about the effectiveness of macroprudential policies, well, we have first that according to De Laricia and others, macroprudential policies are better at reducing the crisis impact than at preventing it. So, uh, and this may be this may be a lesson, for instance, in the U.S. This way of thinking outside the box was critical in solving the the mess the banking the banking industry was in in 2008, and the U.S. was quite quite fast in uh, implementing a number of liquidity facilities open these liquidity facilities not only to bank to banks but also to end users so the mutual funds have access to a specific facility right and so so uh, while on the other hand the federal reserve did nothing to to prevent the crisis okay. now now nevertheless with the new instruments to build capital and liquidity buffers, then happily the ex post cost of a financial crisis are reduced. It will be less costly because the bail-in mechanism and the fact that there is more capital should help and the, the existence of liquidity should help to, uh, to, to reduce this exposed cost of a financial crisis. What we observe on this effectiveness of macroprudential policies for countries that use these instruments when, uh, when uh, the talk about systemic risk was, when the, the thought of systemic risk was not that important, then the, the fact is that reserve requirements during boom years was successful when uh, when there was a problem and so we have examples of uh, countries that before the crisis even had some type of uh, buffers and so for instance we had uh, the uk that used uh, a capital ratio that could be that could go from eight percent to ten percent and when, and so that in this way, in this way, a higher a higher capital ratio allow to reduce the riskiness of the UK financial industry. Problem: it benefited foreign banks. But this, of course, means you have less risk for the UK banks, and the mandate of the UK regulatory body that was the FSA at that time was the solvency of the UK banking system. So, but of course you have to consider these leaks. Other, other examples of successful macroprudential policies, Poland that forced banks to, that, that forced banks that were issuing currency denominated mortgages, right, to, to take to take advantage of the low interest rate on the Swiss francs, you you 
issue mortgages in Swiss francs, but then of course, if we have uh, interest rate parity, this means that it's, it doesn't make any difference. Right? But uh, it forced banks to have a higher capital ratio, and this reduced this, uh, this uh, tendency to take excessive risk. Same thing in Croatia. In Croatia, the credit was increasing at something like 23% per year. And so additional capital reserves were imposed and credit dropped. Well, the rate of growth of credit dropped to 11%, which, although it's incredibly high, was more in line with the reasonable growth. Spain, with all the, with all the catastrophe of the, of the crisis, still had a very consistent provisioning, dynamic provisioning rule that has now been adapted in other countries that implies that in good times you have provisions and in bad times you draw from these generic provisions. And Spain tried to, tried to extend this to other countries in Europe and there was no way because the accountants state that according to their criteria a loss is an incurred loss, an expected loss couldn't be used. And now, of course, the International Standard Board of Accountants see, has changed its view. And now, of course, it's the other way around. You have to provision for an expected loss because as an ins in an insurance company, uh, you have to take into account that in the future there will be losses. And that these will be losses, okay, these losses are covered by your interest rate today, but if you don't provision them, you will discover the losses suddenly when it is too late. And so Brazil, for instance, uh, imposed additional risk weight for high loan-to-value car loans. And again, it worked. Right. So, so the pricing of the, of the loans was higher and therefore there was a decrease in, the, in this credit segment. Okay, then one thing that we have learned with the crisis is indeed the importance of monetary policy. And in, in and its impact on systemic risk. So prior to the crisis, the idea was inflation targeting, and that's it. Now, now with the crisis, we discover that monetary policy was used also for financial stability purposes with the balance sheet of the Fed or the Bank of England being multiplied by two after 2008, right? Quite impressive. But, uh, but the question is, should we use monetary policy to limit the building of risk, of systemic risk? And this, on this, we don't have a clear answer. So you have people that are in favor of the, the concept of leaning against the wind, that is using monetary policy to prevent excessive credit risk, and others that disagree with this. But the first thing we should consider is, of course, the credit channel. We mentioned that financial imbalances were quite often related to excessive credit growth and to uh, bubbles. And the question is therefore, what is the link? Because if we think that monetary policy acts only through interest rate, and that is the monetary, the monetary policy transmission view, it's the money view, sorry, of the monetary policy transmission, then it's all about demand. It's all about demand. And therefore, there is no point in limiting, in limiting, the, in changing monetary policy if it doesn't affect the supply of credit, which is the one that creates the high systemic risk. Uh, 
fortunately, we do have sufficient evidence that indeed, indeed, we do have a credit channel. And the first to prove that were Kashyap and Stein in a, in a classical paper in 2000. But uh, more recently, uh, with the very detailed data set of the Bank of Spain, the credit register, and so who, what is the, 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 the data set is sufficiently detailed so that uh, you know when a firm borrows from two banks, which bank gives it a credit and which bank does not, the same firm. So you, ident you identify perfectly the risk of the borrower, and then you, they confirm, indeed, the existence of the credit channel. Related to this is the risk-taking channel. Indeed, when you, have, when you have a low interest rate, you may have an impact on risk-taking. And so, first, Adrian and Shin show how, if you have a low interest rate, this will reduce the risk of your portfolio. And if it reduces the risk of your portfolio, if you use an internal risk model, then this allows, this means you have a larger capital buffer and you can expand your credit activity. And so, so low interest rate will reduce basically the risk in your portfolio of loans. And the negative impact is that this will allow you, of course, to increase to increase your credit. And we know increase in credit leads to a higher probability of a financial crisis. But there is another side to it. So with, very, with, this, uh, with this data set of the Bank of Spain, which is very detailed, uh, Jimenez and others show that lower interest rate induce lower capitalized bank to increase their risk. So there is indeed a risk-taking channel, and it's precisely banks that have less capital that will use that to increase their risk. And Yonidu and others uh, on a, with a data set in Bolivia and Jimenez and others with this data set in Spain show one thing that we might have already surmised, and that is that when interest rates decrease, you have two effects. The hazard rate of new loan increases, more risk-taking, maybe to to make up for the lower interest you can charge, while at the same time you decrease the risk on the existing loans. And so, and so a uh, low interest rate may have a huge effect on the future, on future uh, credit uh, delinquencies, delinquencies. So, what we have is a number of challenges for regulatory policy. Any questions that we may um, have at this point? Yes, we have some question here. Vela said, I am confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what she said. My understanding was that Adriana and Chin and Taylor blame low interest rates on monetary policy for excessive risk taking and therefore uh, play a major role in the crisis. That is, that interest rate, low interest rates of monetary policy for excessive, uh, excessive risk taking. Yes. So let me go back. Let me go back here to to try to clarify the point. Right. So the basic thing is financial imbalances build up in good times. Okay, so we have low interest rates, no problem, mm, a lax monetary policy, and this implies that banks observe their portfolio, and in their portfolio of loans, these loans have reduced delinquencies because 
low interest rates are low, the interest rate charge may be low, may be low and firms are repaying these loans. Okay? And in good times, this means that the capital constraint is not binding as much, and this means that the bank can expand its credit activities, and this implies, of course, as we mentioned, that excessive, uh, the possibility of an excessive credit expansion. Again, remember, De La Ricci and others tell us that a credit boom only leads to a financial crisis with 33% probability. So, uh, okay. So that's one thing. The portfolio of the banks is better. We are in good times and, and banks expand. But what we observe on, on micro data is that at the same time, at the same time, while, while this while we observe this, uh, no. okay. While we observe this, it is the case that there is a decrease in the portfolio of existing loans, sometimes called legacy assets. Simultaneously, the behavior on new loans is to take more risk, and this, of course, will generate a higher risk in bad times. Right? And so, so that's the idea. Yeah, she concludes, but uh, she replies, however, uh, what about excessive risk-taking in equity a bond on capital market? Has, for example, QE fostered excessive risk-taking? QE. The, the general view is yes. <laughs> that uh, I'm not sure I can pinpoint a paper stating that QE has increased, but indeed the QE has had an impact on low interest rate, and low interest rate allow to have higher prices for bonds and higher prices for um, for equity. And so, in particular, if you observe the interest rate Spain is paying on its 10-year bond, this looks as a perfect bubble. There is no reason. There is no reason, as far as I can see, why investors have such a low remuneration on something that has a reasonable risk. So the answer would be yes. Point taken. So uh, excess liquidity, QE. So Acharya and Natki, Natki have a theoretical paper and uh, saying that excess liquidity will generate asset price bubbles, and so that the idea is not leaning against the wind, it's leaning against liquidity. And simultaneously, a number of papers using the data sets, the large data set we have, and the events in the crisis of Madalona, Madaloni and Pedro, De La Riche and others, Jordan and others, also show that this excessive credit growth has an impact on systemic risk, and this excessive credit growth is fueled, of course, by sufficient or excess liquidity. So, new challenges for regulatory policy. So, while the pre-2007 regulatory framework fail, we now have the tools to go further. And so let me because I think we are we are fine. short yeah. on ah, time. Ten more minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So more okay, minutes. we know basically what failed, right? We were the regulation was focusing on individual banks' risk, and uh, there was no market discipline because of the expected bailouts. We do did not have a bail-in mechanism, no good resolution mechanism. In some countries like Spain, the the resolution of a bank was common law, and Germany the same, was common law. There was not a specific bank bankruptcy procedure, and so it could take five years to, to the resolution of, of a bank, therefore fostering the bailout, of course. Uh, there was the possibility of regulatory arbitrage more, more easily. Okay, and so 
we had uh, limited cross-border cooperation and some even some competition, cross-border competition, and there was no consideration of the of the risk of the systemic risk that this uh, economic growth and credit growth implied. So, challenge. One challenge, one important challenge is that we have regulatory cycles and we have to take this into account. So, after a crisis, there is huge regulation. But in good times, there is a tendency to deregulate. So, somehow, uh, I would like to think of resilient regulation, right? So, design today regulation that could be maintained once things are okay and every single country wants to grow and wants to have more credit. Also, if we have rules uh, rather than discretion, uh, it's more difficult to manipulate. And so that's the, the example of the, of the leverage ratio. The leverage ratio basically is very difficult to manipulate, while the internal risk models could be somehow adjusted to have a uh, high or lower level of risk. And also, also we have the problem with how well defined is the target of regulation. Because if it's not clearly defined, then it's subject to political pressure. And so, so it's very difficult to, to have a systemic risk board that will be accountable for the level of systemic risk. Because this means that, you know, what is systemic risk? How do you measure systemic risk? We have at least three measures of systemic risk, and the correlation is not perfect. So if you have such an institution, then the political pressure is much, much stronger. There is, uh, nevertheless, there is there are possibilities. So I remember. Uh, visiting Norway and, uh, and uh, supervising, monitoring how they proceed with monetary policy. And uh, they have uh, the criterion for the counter-cyclical buffer is that is the, the Central Bank of Norway that proposes to implement the counter-cyclical buffer and then the ministry, the government, reacts and say yes, no. But there is a cost of saying no, right? So there is some, some checks and balances that I definitely like, but of course, it's not easy to have this, this type of social capital in all countries, right? Okay, microprudential challenges have uh, somewhat been met. So the idea of bail-in and bailable debt means that we are reestablishing some market discipline. And the problem with market discipline in the crisis was that market discipline was based on short-term debt. And once in the crisis, it became a panic, right? So the idea of market discipline is to discriminate between good banks and bad banks. If you have a panic, it definitely uh, doesn't help you. It's rather the other way around. So market discipline should be rather on longer term than on short term uh, investors. So bail-in banks restructuring and resolution procedures have been, have been set and now as you know uh, the regulation is not only bank, is not only restricted to bank institutions in the legal sense but to banks and non-banks if these non-banks are systemic and affect the, the banking industry. So that AIG nowadays is followed by the Fed, which was not the case, of course, before, before the crisis. And also, also a number of countries have adopted rules like ring fencing, the Volcker rule. Europe, Europe is also taking this view that banks cannot use proprietary, cannot develop proprietary trading to define the boundaries of banking activity. 
Macroprudential challenges are more demanding, I would say, for a number of points. Do they have clear objectives? Is not systemic risk is not as easily measured as inflation. Right? Inflation gives you inflation targeting, and this allows central bank to be perfectly independent. Right. So uh, if the if the government says inflation target is two percent, the central bank just have to implement that. And so, here this is not the case. And then you have, uh, you have this trade-off between financial stability and uh, economic growth that is quite a political issue. And therefore, it means that the, the macro prudential authority is accountable for this. This is even more complicated by the fact that when you consider type 1 and type 2 errors, and we expect we expect the macroprudential authorities to be somewhere in between, you will only observe type 1 errors, that is, missing a financial crisis. You will never observe that you have avoided a financial crisis because you, you don't see it, right? So politically, it will be quite, quite complicated. So that's why choosing the right instrument so, say, setting a level of loan-to-value for mortgages is much easier than imposing a counter-cyclical buffer. Okay, so let me, let me, let me go to the, to the, the conclusion. Uh, mention just that we have, in addition, we have international challenges. Because macroprudential policy should consider capital flows, but at the same time, capital flows react to global risk, even as measured by the VIX uh, Chicago index. And consequently, and consequently, it means that suddenly these capital flows will be quite different with sudden stop for some countries and will create additional layers of systemic risk. So, to conclude, uh, the new bank regulatory framework should pay greater attention to systemic risk, prevent the buildup of financial imbalances, monitor cross-border spillovers that uh, we know exist since Pick and Pick and Rosenberg, Improve banks' resolution procedures, which we have done. Strengthen banks' bank supervision, which we have done. Strengthen market discipline, which we have done. Recognize that monitoring prudential policy cannot be independent, which we have not done. And it's a complex issue and leading related to this debate, leaning against the wind or not. And finally, avoid, of course, ex excessive cost to the regulated that we shouldn't that we shouldn't forget. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, um, for your talk. There are uh, here a couple of questions, and you also can uh, ask. Um, when is referred to, I think it's your slide 29, uh, where you're talking about the challenges. And one issue is regarding, uh, yeah, the second point, regulation, regulation crowd out, crowded out market discipline. So I guess one question is, uh, what, what is in your view the role that market discipline has to be in the regulatory framework? As you said here, regulation has tend to, or the new regulations tend to displace market discipline as a regulatory tool. And, uh, well, that's one question you can answer. Yeah. Mm, definitely, the key issue is that bailouts impose a limit to market discipline. If everybody knows that the bank will be bailout, right, uh, then there is uh, no reason to suspect that you will ever suffer a loss on your 10-year bond. Well, a 10-year bond is a reasonable investment. It's not uh, our deposit, right? We, we have deposit insurance, which is quite natural. But 
and so and so the problem was with bailouts and why do we have bailouts because it was very difficult to have the, to liquidate a bank very difficult very costly and a very long procedure and also if you have uh, this very long procedure taking for five years it implies illiquidity of all the assets that are involved in the in the liquidation and so on and the fact is therefore that we have improved on this front because now we have resolution uh, clear clearly defined resolution procedures and in addition we have uh, the bail-in of uh, the possibility to that to have a number of perfectly defined uh, bonds that will take losses in case of the bank being of a, a bank liquidation and this makes it credible and therefore this implies more market discipline yeah another point refers to point six uh, is there really a trade-off between financial financial stability and growth uh, could you elaborate on well uh, I'm afraid so <laughs> I'm afraid so on this I think that uh, take the counter cyclical buffer right through the counter cyclical buffer you reduce credit and when you reduce credit you reduce economic growth that's indeed uh, a clear case but uh, what is interesting is when we have a trade-off uh, we would like to be on the on the efficient frontier right and so to be on an efficient frontier means that you have to to put there the right regulation right that this is Pareto efficient and that you have the best level of financial stability and the best level of economic growth at the same time yeah. uh, Mauricio Quiroga he asked uh, according to your experience uh, what have been the effect global effect of the new regulatory policies that have been in place especially regarding uh, the level of deleveraging in the financial the global financial system so is that effect already there yes uh, it's already there although although uh, what we have uh, in Europe we have uh, a sovereign risk uh, a country with sovereign risk and uh, and therefore uh, this implies that we may be mm, riding a sovereign risk bubble in fact with the LTRO type of uh, and so so that this means that the balance sheet of these banks are not as clean and transparent as we would like them to be on the other hand I think for instance banks banks in the in the US have deleveraged and uh, and are nowadays in good shape another question yeah can you take the mic there please is it in green yeah we have a question from the floor yeah, a question regarding uh, emerging markets actually I think have a, a you know, bigger, bigger challenge because uh, we are very exposed to external, external shock and in that regard um, what, what do you think where do, where do we have to pay more attention to um, in terms of external risk, one one can think of uh, China, and you mentioned that uh, the real estate bubbles can more or less be identified. Do you, do you, think, do you think that we have a, <coughs> a bubble in China? And if so, what would be the potential implications of the bubble? Hmm. Yes. The okay. So one important thing for emerging countries is capital inflows and capital outflows these are indeed critical and so monetary policy in this uh, in this country should definitely not be just concerned about inflation it should also consider the channeling of capital inflows that may go into financing mortgages 
and mortgages may simply have an impact on the price of uh, real estate. And so, so this is, I think, we have to be very cautious about this. Regarding, regarding the Chinese uh, boom, uh, I think it's quite possible that we have a bubble uh, and that the bubble is, that we had a bubble and that the bubble is bursting now in the stock market. And uh, there are measures in the, in the real estate market. There are measures that, for instance, there are such that, for instance, you, in Shanghai, you have to be a resident for one year before you buy property. So, to some extent, this limits the bubble on the residential side. And so, I don't know how effective this has been. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take, uh, we had a lot of questions, but we're going to take one more. Uh, what is your take on capital controls as a macropotential policy? I think it's a desperate measure. <laughs> uh, my view, uh, I think it's Uruguay, I think it's Uruguay that simply use um, additional reserves on banks to cope with capital inflows. And so I think it's uh, on the model, on, on with, if we put down some equations, I think we should have an equivalence between the two. But capital controls is quite drastic, while changing risk weights, changing the uh, setting additional capital at the level of banks is a milder measure that will allow to reduce the capital inflow while, while you know, in a, while preserving while preserving the the capital inflows like uh, foreign direct investment and the like okay so yeah well we had a few questions but i guess uh, uh for the sake of time uh we want to thank Sembla your participation today um I think we can all agree that your new books will become a reference, a first-hand reference, such as the first, your first book. Thank you. And uh, you're always welcome here at Sembla. Thank you. Thanks to all. Okay. We can leave now. <laughs>